Take your Bible and open it, if you would, to the book of Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter, I mean, sorry, the eleventh chapter. That's where we'll begin our reading. As you turn there, let me just say it is good to be here this morning to, as it was said, have an audience. Um, It is um, a different experience to speak to um, three ugly men sitting in the front, you know, it, um, it, uh, no, it is good to be back. It is not yet anywhere close to our normal gathering, but it is better than what we had last week in the last couple of weeks, and hopefully we can continue and make progress toward that normal, and appreciate all who are here, appreciate those that are visiting with us, glad that you are here. Ecclesiastes 9, or 11 and verse 9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Youth is a good time, he says. And I mean, how many people have said, Oh, if I could just be young again. The time of one's youth is supposed to be a time of enjoyment, of pleasure. But you keep reading... And he says, walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. He says, rejoice in the time of your youth. But then he qualifies this. And he says, but remember, everything you do at every stage of life, you're accountable to God. And in your youth, you need to put away wickedness. In your youth, you need to remember your Creator. Youth, the time when we're young, ought to be a time of enjoyment and pleasure. But it needs to be the same kind of joy that Paul speaks of in Philippians 4. Verse 4 when he says, rejoice in the Lord. That we need to live our lives within the Lord. This idea of know that God will bring you into judgment, it doesn't have to be a scary thought. It ought to always be a sobering thought. It ought to be the kind of thing that causes us to reflect very deeply very seriously, but if we serve God in the days of our youth, and I mean by that we start the pattern that will continue on, the thought of judgment ought not to be a frightening thing. The lesson today about serving God, yes, it's geared primarily toward those who are younger than me, Um, but those who are parents hopefully take lessons from it things they can be teaching their children, grandparents. And really, so much of what I intend to say to the young people will apply to any age group. It's not just that, but it does have a special emphasis. And I want to start off with five things that God wants from you when you're young. And that doesn't mean when you get older, you leave these behind. But he wants these things to start when you're a young person. And the very first thing is what's said here in verse 1. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. You need early on to realize there is one greater than you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The faith the Bible speaks of is that faith that he is that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Consider what's said in Romans 1 and verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice how Paul, in a sense, plays on words here. 
He said there are things that are invisible. We can't see God. We can't see His power, His divinity. And yet, He said, these things are clearly seen by the things He's made. This world is a testimony to God's power, to His might. My lesson this morning is not intended to go into all the arguments for why you ought to believe in God. Yes, we can't see God, but there's plenty of reason to believe in God. And one of the things that through the years has bothered me, bothered me deeply, is sometimes to see people reach a certain age and they begin to hear those casting doubt upon the existence of God, that denying His existence, promoting the idea that we're just here by evolutionary chance. And what happens sometimes is people just say, okay, I, that sounds good to me, without ever coming to those who could say, you know there's an answer to that, right? <laughs> you know, that, that's not the final you know, what you heard that college professor say, what your friend said, what was touted in this Hollywood movie, there is an answer. And I guess this morning my main point to those who are younger is you hear somebody denying the existence of God, allow those of us with faith to answer, to talk with you. Don't just buy into that. But when you realize that God's your creator, it changes your life. You realize you're not autonomous, that you don't get to make the rules. And that's important. In this context of Romans 1, what's the problem? He said the Gentile world's making its own rules. They didn't see these things that should have been clearly seen. And so they just drifted farther and farther into ungodliness and immorality. We need a faith that will keep us from that. And once we come to faith in God, we need to realize God's communicated and He wants us to know what He has to say. I'm thinking of 2 Timothy 3 where Paul is near the end of his life and he tells Timothy there are going to be persecutions. There's going to be evil in his world. Verse 13, evil men growing worse and worse. But here's what Timothy was to do. But you, verse 14, must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He'll go on in the next verse to talk about the things that Scripture can do. You know, that it being inspired of God, it'll teach, it'll reprove, it'll correct, it will furnish one to every good work. But I want to really catch this point. He says, from childhood, you began to learn the Scriptures very early on. And quite obviously, this involved the work of Lois and Eunice, his grandmother and his mother. But there comes a point, and it ought to come fairly early in our lives, when we begin to realize it is our responsibility that we take it upon ourselves, that young people are not getting their, as we say sometimes, get your lesson up. Not because parents are making them but because they want to learn that they are listening to the sermons taking them in not because well they'll get in trouble if they don't but because they want to grow we need to understand the importance of God's word and God from our childhood wants us to know this and there I would say even in our youth God wants us to obey His gospel. Now, let's clarify. We're not talking about extreme youth. Baptism in the Bible 
contrary to what is practiced worldwide in various religions, be Catholicism, Orthodox, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, probably some others, infant baptism is not found in the New Testament. It's for believers. It's for people who repent of their sins, Acts 2.38. But there comes a point, and it doesn't have, you don't have to be old to begin to understand what the Bible's saying about sin. What it's saying about Jesus as a Savior. What it's saying about following Him as a disciple. And when you begin to understand those things, when you begin to grasp the seriousness of sin, the need for a Savior, when you are able to understand what it would mean to be a disciple of Jesus, then you need to be obedient to Him. Hebrews 5, 9, He is the author of eternal salvation to those who obey Him. The contrast that's found in Romans 6, 17 and 18, He said, you were servants of sin, but something changed. What changed? You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. I want you to, not, no, not, I, I'm not talking little children. But I am talking as folks, sometimes, sometimes it's a little before the teen years, but certainly somewhere within the teen years. We begin to understand these things. And we need to put our faith in Christ and be baptized into Christ. That's what Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says we should do. And I want to urge young people, be zealous. You know, here's one of those, maybe it's the conundrum. You know, we, when you're young and you're inexperienced, there are certain limits on things you can do. Sometimes, and this happens in all of life, we allow the things we can't do to convince us we can't do anything. You know, there are limitations. You know, I've often used this, and since it always draws a laugh, I'll use it one more time. You know, the fact that I realize I can't lead singing, well, I can lead singing. I just can lead singing very poorly. Um, you know, that if I, I can't do that well, do I just resign myself to doing nothing? Or do I try to figure out what I can do? And do those things. In Romans, the 12th chapter, in verse 11, in, a, in the midst of one of those sections, you know, Paul, Paul is known for some long developed paragraphs. And then every now and then, he has one of those sections where it's just rapid fire exhortations. Instead of some long developed thought, it's boom, 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 boom. We'd call them bullet points. Well, Romans 12, verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Who ought to be described as not lagging in diligence? Not fervent in spirit. Older Christians? Kind of middle-aged Christians? Young Christians? Or just Christians? All of us ought to be fervent in spirit. All of us ought to be abounding in the work of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And the work of the Lord is not limited to what we see go on within this assembly. I guess if there is one positive, there aren't a whole lot of positives that have come out of these last six months, I don't think. But you know, one of them is it has made me reflect even more deeply on the fact that being a Christian is not primarily about what I do during the typical, you know, in normal times, about four hours a week that we're gathered. I have come to appreciate those four hours more, and I long for the time when we will have those normal four hours. I appreciate them more, but I also realize 
We're Christians the other 164 hours a week. That there are things that can be done. You know, young people, don't be afraid to ask. What could I do? Is there somebody that could use my help? You know, maybe you could mow a yard, clean a house, babysit for somebody. You know, sometimes, and we all know what the family plan is. You know, you first start to drive, you're listed on the auto insurance, but you're listed under your parents' names. Your medical insurance, you're on the family plan. There's not a spiritual family plan. I mean, there's a plan for the family. But even as young Christians, you're responsible for your choices, your commitment to the Lord. Be zealous. I hear sometimes people talk about the dangers of being second or third generation Christians. And they mean that, you know, people who, dis- who learn the truth coming out of, you know, some kind of ungodly background, they appreciate the truth more. I don't know if that's true in all cases. I know ideally godly parents are one of the greatest blessings you can have in this world. You know, yeah, if you don't have godly parents, you may not ever learn the truth. You know, you, what a blessing they are. And, and their faith is something you can build off of. But it can't be your faith. They can't obey for you. Realize that. Remember that. A fifth thing I believe God wants from you in your youth is to emphasize spiritual things. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. But bod- or for, bodily, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. It may just be me, and I... When I offer an opinion, I I want to clearly identify it as an opinion. And this is an opinion. But it seems to me that at the age at which we have the fewest responsibilities, we sometimes have the most distractions. You think about being a young person. You know, besides school, you have all these clubs that Everybody wants you to be in. They want you to be in the drama club, in the beta club, in the history club, the math club, assuming you can do a little bit of adding and subtracting. You know, they they want you to be in the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. They want you to play this sport and that sport. And they want you to be in the band and they want you to take piano. They want you to learn to draw. And, you know, there are all these things that everybody's saying, you need to learn this while you're young and be part of it. You won't get the chance to do this when you're older. And the things I have mentioned, none of these are evil things. And in fact, I think there are some benefits to every one of those. And yet, they can become too much. They can crowd out. What's most important in your life? It's not that there's no place for the arts, for the academics, for the sports. But even in your youth, the study of God's Word, you're being present for worship. You're being, hey, taking time to pray. To develop your character, that's what matters most. You know, developing a good swing for golf, baseball, you know, okay, that's fine. But developing character is more important. In Luke, the 8th chapter, in verse 14, he tells the parable, this is toward the conclusion of the parable of the sower. The explanation is, You remember some seed had fallen among thorns? And it said the thorns choked it. 
Verse 14, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Most young people are not going to be choked out by the riches of this life. And maybe not even by the cares, although sometimes they can care pretty deeply about how a ball game turns out or, you know, some of these other things. But the pleasures of life and as parents, we need to be careful that we're not so concerned about making sure our children enjoy their youth that we don't push too many things upon them, that we don't end up raising them on thorny ground. Because that may not change when they get older. Five things. Now the lesson's not over yet, so don't, don't grab your songbook. Five things that God wants from you in your, in your youth. What I want to ask you to think about for a few moments is why in your youth? Why don't we just wait? Well, the fact is, at some point in your youth, you need to be forgiven. I like the way... Moses put it in Deuteronomy 139, and I hope you remember, I'll say this from time to time, anytime I say the way Paul expressed it, Moses expressed it, Amos, I'm not d discounting the inspiration, but when God inspired men, he used their own unique ways and talents to but he said it this way about the young people. He said, they today have no knowledge of good and evil. These little ones, he's talking about how when they had come out of Egypt and they didn't want to enter the land of Canaan, they were afraid. They said, our little ones will be the ones that die. And he said, your little ones that today don't know anything about good and evil will be the ones that actually will enter into the land. These little ones, and we've got some wonderful young children here. They don't know good and evil. And even as they begin to understand the idea of disobeying their parents, the idea of relating that to a God who is their ruler, their creator, is a very difficult concept. But the time will come when you'll understand it. That you will understand as was read earlier today. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you need forgiveness. In Acts the 8th chapter. Again, this is one of those. Everybody knows the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. But I just want to catch the very end of verse 39. After this man was baptized, it said he went on his way rejoicing you can spend your youth and for that matter your adult life in fear or you can come in obedience to Christ have your sins washed away and learn to live with joy true joy you know there is a there's happiness of different measures you give me a soft serve chocolate ice cream cone. And that makes me happy in a sense. I enjoy that. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's joy on a very low level. You know, youth to be truly enjoyed has to be enjoyed without guilt. You know, I, that's part of why that Chocolate ice cream cone, I feel a little guilty when I'm eating it, you know. So I always get the small, you know. No. Even if you're going through your youth or your adult years, your older years, and you know you're not right with God, you, you'll enjoy certain moments, but you won't have that joy that lasts. And I'm concerned because I've seen this happen. And I guarantee you there are people 
my age and older who've seen this happen. Seen people that they knew had an interest, but for whatever reason, they, they would say, not right now. I'm not quite ready. And they never get ready. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 talks about the conscience seared with a hot iron. That there are people who, they feel the sting of the gospel. The gospel is intended. The Holy Spirit came. John 16 said to convict the world of sin. It's intended to bring upon us a sense of guilt. And people feel it. But sometimes for whatever reason, they're not ready. There are those, of course, who one day obey. But I worry when I see somebody putting it off that I know is ready, you know, and I'm talking about as far as their understanding of things, it concerns me. I worry. I'm not a morbid type person. You know, I, I don't dwell on death all the time. You know, I, I've told a story one time about helping moderate a debate. It was a Bible debate. The question was over whether a church could have a, as they called it, a located preacher. Someone like me that worked with a group on a regular basis. The guy who didn't believe in that, I promise you every speech he somehow got the conversation turned around to dying. I mean, he had that kind of obsession. He would talk about the death angel's wings fluttering outside the window and we're supposed to be talking about whether a church could support a preacher. You know, I, I don't want to be that kind of guy. Yet, you've got reality to deal with. James 4, verse 13. Come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Young people, this is you too. You don't know about tomorrow. I know what the statistics are. Well, I know in general. Statistically speaking, if you're 16 years old, You've got, in all probability, another 60, 65 years of life left. You know, some of it depends on whether you're male or female. Race, ethnicity in, enters into all of that. But those are just statistics. How many young people have you heard about right here in Limestone County in the last year that were killed in car accidents? I don't know why it has stuck with me so much. But it was just so, to me, so sad several years ago. And, it, and when I say several, I'm at the point in my life, it could be anywhere between 5 and 20. But several years ago, a group of seniors in Gadsden, Alabama, they were having their senior party. You know how seniors like to have their gathering. They were out at a park. The wind came up. And a tree limb snapped, fell, and hit one of the senior girls in the head and killed her. I mean, just a day or two before graduation. Now, what are the odds of that happening? A hundred percent for that girl. It, those kind of things happen. If you know what you ought to do, he says, do it. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Why should you serve God when you're young? Because you may not be old. You ought to be a diligent Bible student right now because it's easier to learn. One of the, there are values in getting older and having more years of experience as I've said sometimes you, you're able to see connections that you 
didn't see when you were younger. The more you learn, the more you can. But yet, I want to tell you something. Memory work gets a lot harder. Remembering things. And when you get older, you're going, I know it's in there somewhere. I, I, I kind of think it's on this left-hand side of my Bible. You know, whereas when you're younger, take advantage. Take advantage of these years when your brain is at its prime. Use these years to learn. Timothy, from childhood. You may, not, <laughs> you may not realize it yet, but it is so much easier right now. One of the reasons, and this is vitally important, begin to serve God at, at your, in your youth. And you don't develop the kind of habits that are difficult to break. Have you ever been going through the New Testament noticing that these letters are written to Christians? They're written to, for example, the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. It's written to the saints that are in Ephesus, the holy ones in Ephesus. And what do these letters contain? They contain warnings against sexual immorality. They contain warnings against bad language. You think, well, why do Christians need these things? And they're not written as though, you know, just by the way, just lest you forget, these are things you shouldn't do. They're written as though these are issues among them. Well, these are people that had come out of sinful lives. They had come out of ungodliness. Sometimes people have the idea and this is even among folks who have Christian parents well I just want to have some fun while I'm young that fun leads to sometimes addictions Galatians 5 and verse 22 he warns us that drunkenness is a work of the flesh that will keep us from the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God people get addicted to alcohol to drugs early in life. They, they, they pick up habits of thought processes. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Through the years, I've known people that, Christians, who sometimes... In the wrong circumstance, they'd let loose with a bad word. And they'd feel terrible about it. Why did they say that bad word right then? Because that was the way they talked when they were younger. And they have made efforts to get rid of it. And they've largely overcome it. But sometimes it creeps back up. Because it was a habit that was established early. Ephesians 5 and verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Uncleanness, filthiness. Listen, I, I really encourage everybody to bathe, shower regularly. But that's not the kind of uncleanness, the filthiness he's talking about here. This is in a context connected with fornication, sexual immorality. The coarse jesting, you know, we, we call it dirty jokes. But the filth of pornography, and that was a first century issue. You know, it is more widely available now. You know, it is more accessible, but it's been a problem for years. These are habits that people can get into that are difficult to break. But if you don't develop the habit, you never have to break the habit. You know, it, it's, it's that way. Just the other day, 
had the radio on and a comedian was talking about quitting smoking, you know, and how difficult it was to quit. And, you know, of course, you know, he said that his wife told him, he said, why don't you just quit? And he said, I just looked at her and said, well, why don't you just stop yelling? And um, I don't know how well that went, you know, but you know, if you've ever been a smoker, you know, it's not just easy to quit. Sinful habits like pornography, alcohol, drugs, they're easy to quit. I, I don't have a temptation to smoke because I didn't take up the habit. If you don't take up pornography and alcohol and drugs and bad language, you'll never have to fight that battle of breaking the habit. And you can prevent some serious mistakes. Sometimes when it comes to sins that young people especially commit, you know, there's a balance. If they repent of it, I want to offer full, unequivocal support of them. I don't want to, I don't want to put more guilt upon them. But you think about flee sexual immorality is the statement, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. The King James says flee fornication. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all in the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. To be blunt, he's saying sex before marriage and outside of marriage is a sin. And it is like any other sin, it can be forgiven. But let's understand, it sometimes can carry a heavy price with it. Disease, the pregnancies, Sometimes the emotional baggage it takes into a marriage, you know, lack of spirituality leads to sometimes bad marriage choices. And one is stuck for years in a difficult relationship. Or they end up unscripturally divorced. You know, I mentioned earlier about breaking the habits of drugs and alcohol. Do you know what a drug arrest can do to you? An alcohol-related arrest? Having a record is not a good thing. It will put more difficulties upon your life. Now, temptation being what it is, you can make the decision early on in life to serve God and you may still succumb to a temptation and if you do repent of it and I hope that others will support you and try to help you overcome that but the reality is you can prevent a lot of these things that may haunt you if you will choose to serve God early on and you will feel better about yourself. Ephesians 4 verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. I hear a lot of people talk about self-image. Self-esteem. You know what the Bible says about self-esteem? It starts off by saying all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know that. It basically says, I want you to feel really bad about yourself. I want you to feel guilty. I want you to realize that you are hopeless and helpless apart from God. But then, when you come to Him in faith, what does He do? He calls, you, he calls worthy of the calling. He makes you His child. His heir. He calls you a holy one. He promises you a hope of heaven. People get all into family lineages sometimes. And, and I'll tell you, you know, you start shaking that family tree, some nuts are going to fall out. You know, you're going you're to think, well, 
Ooh, I wish I hadn't found that out about my great-grandfather. You know, it, those kind of things happen. There's nothing wrong, though, with knowing about family. But you just think about it. You can be a child of God. That's going to make a difference in how you live, how you feel about yourself. And I want to, I just got this one and one more. This is one I wish I had thought more about when I was younger. That you are influencing others even as a young person. Matthew 5, which is to all disciples, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If you will be a Christian as a young person, as a teenager, someone into your early 20s and on up beyond that, but you have a unique opportunity. Your teenage friends, your friends in their 20s, they are the people who in many ways, they're the most carefree, most interested in let the good times roll, let's just all have a good party, let's live life, and you go, I can't do anything with them. At the same time, they are the most open and least prejudiced against the truth. You know, you know, those friends of yours that love to go out and party on the weekends, they're also people who have not had 60 years of being ingrained in church doctrine. In all likelihood, even if they've been going to church, they haven't been paying much attention. You know, there's a unique opportunity. You've got the opportunity to be an influence on them. And just be aware of this. Even if you're not able to influence them to turn to the Lord right now. You live the kind of life before your friends, before others, that is godly and is good and is kind, that is humble and gentle. People will remember that. And there may come a point in their life. Sometimes people get a little older in life and something happens that is a wake-up call to them. Who are they going to pick up the phone and call? The guy that they were going out drinking with every night? I remember, you know, Bill was awfully nice in school. I'm going to give him a call. Maybe he could help me. You're influencing others. And I might say, you may also be a negative influence if you're not careful. But the last thing, and this may seem like an anticlimactic one, but there's going to come a point when you're going to realize you need God. 1 Peter 3, in verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I think a lot of people see God like that fire alarm that you see so many times in places. In case of emergency, break glass and you know, then you can pull that. Now the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. Don't go through life. Don't go through your teenage years, through your 20s, your 30s, and on beyond, 
without knowing that you've got the help of God, that you've got that opportunity to turn to Him in prayer. What's today's lesson? Is serve God and serve Him now. I'm not going to review every point. That's it. The question is now, will you do that? We talked about what you need to do if you're not a Christian. That is, you need to turn from your sins and be baptized into Christ. It may be that there's someone here today, young, not so young, that once made that decision, but somewhere you lost that commitment. Come back to him now. If we can help you make your life right with God, why don't you come while we stand and sing together? Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel, and in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.